Sorry for the sudden break there. Um, where were we? All right. Um, Langmuir and Tonks discovered electron density waves in plasmas that are now known as Langmuir waves. Sorry, Langmuir waves. There's a couple things that I want to hover over and reread. Sorry, I was kind of speeding through because I knew my roommate was out walking a dog and would be coming back in. And he then returned, and um, it would be noisy. It's also just weird having someone walk in while you're recording stuff. And the software I use to to record this doesn't have just like a pause button. It just has a stop button. At least I don't think it has a pause. Yeah, so it's like I have to start a whole other. Anyway, whatever. Um, let's actually just go through real quick and see. We already talked about surface chemistry. Um, Gilbert N. Lewis, an American physical chemist and dean of the College of Chemistry at Berkeley. Cubicle atom, cubicle atom theory was an early atomic model in which electrons were positioned at the eight corners of a cube in a nonpolar atom or molecule. <coughs> um, incandescent lamp, yeah, we're going to read more about that. Okay, cool. Um, let's get into the Nernst. No, we already... Actually, let me see real quick if that's a short article. Um, we'll read that afterwards. Okay. Uh, <laughs> synecdoche, synecdoche. I don't know what it is. How about this? Major development was the improvement of the diffusion pump. Diffusion pumps use a high-speed jet of vapor to direct gas molecules in the pump throat down into the bottom of the pump and at the exhaust. They were the first type of high vacuum pumps operating in the regime of free molecular flow, where the movement of gas molecules pardon me, where the movement of gas molecules can be better understood as diffusion than by conventional fluid dynamics. Okay, that's that's a longer one. Eh, we'll, we'll probably come back to that. But that's just to understand it really quick. Okay. Ah, eh, whatever. Well, you know, we're probably going to end up doing a whole bunch of offshoot videos on this one. Okay. Back onto his research. So, Langmuir and Tonks discovered electron density waves in plasmas that are now known as Langmuir waves. He introduced the concept of electron temperature and in 1924 invented the diagnostic method for measuring both temperature and density with an electrostatic probe, now called a Langmuir probe, and commonly used in plasma physics. The current of a biased probe tip is measured as a function of bias voltage to determine the local plasma temperature and density. He also discovered atomic hydrogen which he put to use by inventing the atomic hydrogen welding process, the first plasma weld ever made. Plasma welding has since been developed into gas tungsten arc welding. In 1917, he published a paper on the chemistry of oil films that later became the basis for the award of the 1932 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Langmuir theorized that oils consisting of an aliphatic chain with a hydrophilic end group perhaps an alcohol or acid, were oriented as a film one molecule thick upon the surface of water with the hydrophilic group down in the water and the hydrophobic chains clumped together on the surface. The thickness of the film could be easily determined from the known volume and area of the oil, which, which allowed investigation of the molecular configuration before spectroscopic techniques were available. Yeah, there is a lot to search here. Uh, a lot a lot of other articles to read. Later years. Following World War I, Langmuir contributed to atomic theory and the understanding of atomic structure by defining the modern concept of valence shells and isotopes. That's an important thing. Langmuir was president of the Institute of Radio Engineers in 1923. Based on his work at General Electric, John B. Taylor developed a detector ionizing beams of alkali metals called nowadays the Langmuir-Taylor detector. In 1927, he was one of the participants of the fifth 
Solvay Conference on Physics that took place at the International Solvay Institute for Physics in Belgium. He joined Catherine B. Bloodgit Blod- Blod- to study thin films in surface absorption, ad- adsorption rather. They introduced the concept of a monolayer, a layer of material one molecule thick, and the two-dimensional physics which describes such a surface. In 1932, he received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his discoveries and investigations in surface chemistry. In 1938, Langmuir's scientific interests began to turn to atmospheric science and meteorology. One of his first ventures, although tangentially related, was a refutation of the claim of entomologist Charles H. T. Townsend that the deer bot fly flew at speeds of over 800 miles per hour. What? 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 What was this dude? <laughs> 800 miles per hour. <laughs> what? <laughs> Dude, freaking deer bot flies breaking the sound, the, uh, the, the speed of sound. Holy smokes. Langmuir estimated the fly speed at 25 miles per hour. Yo. Oh my goodness. That's like what? Uh, a 32nd of, uh, of, uh, Townsend speed. Anyway, after observing windrows of drifting seawood, what is windrows? Okay, row of cut hay or small grain crop. It is allowed to dry before being baled, combined, and rolled. Okay, windrows. After observing a uh, windrows of drifting seawood in the Sargasso Sea, he discovered a wind-driven surface circulation in the sea. It is now called the Langmuir Circulation. Man, he's got a lot named after him. During World War II, Langmuir and research associate Vincent G. Sh- uh, sorry, Vincent J. Schaefer uh, worked on improving naval sonar for submarine detection, and later develop uh, and later to develop protective smoke screens and met- methods for dicing. De- oh, de-icing, de-icing, removing ice. Methods for de-icing aircraft rings. The, uh, this research led him to theorize and then demonstrate in the laboratory and in the atmosphere that the introduction of ice nuclei, dry ice, and silver iodide into a sufficiently moist cloud of low temperature, supercooled water could induce precipitation, cloud seeding, uh, though in frequent practice, particularly in Australia and the People's Republic of China, the efficiency of this technique remains controversial today. In 1953, Langmuir coined the term pathological science, describing research conducted with accordance to the scientific method, but tainted by unconscious bias or subjective effects. He coined the term... Oh, okay, okay. I get, I get what it's saying. Yeah, P- okay. He coined the term for when people are following the scientific method, but they're actually uh, kind of twisting stuff without even realizing it. This is in contrast to pseudoscience, which has no pretense of following the scientific method. In his original speech, he presented ESP and flying saucers as examples of pathological science. Since then, the label has been applied to polywater and cold fusion. I'm not familiar with polywater. Hypothesized polymerized form of water that is the subject of much scientific controversy during the late 60s. By 69, the popular press had taken notice and sparked fears of a polywater gap. It still doesn't tell me what it is. Oh, this is a long article. I don't uh, I'll read that maybe some other time. In cold fusion, type of nuclear reaction that would occur at or near room temperature. Okay. <laughs> well, that that's a really important thing to, to coin, to, to put a name to, because even still today, pathological science... Like that happens so often. When when I finally like got a, a glimpse into academia, when I uh, worked in research very briefly as an intern, just like talking with research scientists about just different papers out there that I that I had looked to and been like, these are really cool discoveries, and hearing just the bias that like is known within departments uh, towards certain papers, it's just like what is going on here? People, like people all the time just making it say what they want. It's uh, it's really disheartening. I always thought that academia was the one, like the one truth that you can uh, hold to, but academia is 
it, it's got a lot of issues, a lot of issues. Um, anywho, his house in Synecdoche or Synecdoche, I don't know, was designated a National Historic Landmark in 96. Personal life. Langmuir was married to Marion Mercereau uh, from 83 until 1970. Oh, she was alive, rather, from 83 until 1971. Outlived him by like 20 years. Um, married her in 1912, with whom he adopted two children, Kenneth and Barbara. After a short illness, he died in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, from a heart attack on August 16, 1957. His obituary ran on the front page of the New York Times. On his religious views, Langmuir was an agnostic. In fiction, according to author Kurt Vonnegut, or Vonnegut um, Langmuir was the inspiration for his fictional scientist Dr. Felix Huneker in the novel Cat's Cradle. Oh, I've heard of that a lot. Yeah, that's a really popular one. I still need to read that. Uh, and the character's invention of Ice-9 a new phase of water ice, similar to Ice-9. Um, uh, Langmuir had worked with Vonnegut's brother, Bernard Vonnegut, at General Electric on seeding ice crystals to diminish or increase rain or storms. Huh. Um, honors that he's received Fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, Sciences member of the American Philosophical Society, the Perkin Medal, Nobel and uh, Nobel in Chemistry, Franklin Medal, Faraday Medal, Johnson, John J. Cardi Award uh, from uh, NAS, uh, Mount Langmuir in Alaska is named after him, uh, Langmuir College, um, a residential college at Stony Brook University in Hquad, named for him. Uh, a grandson uh, directed a 57-minute documentary in 99, 1999 called Langmuir's World. He's got patents for um, the incandescent electric lamp. That's patent 1,180,159. He's got patent 1,244,217 for electron discharge apparatus and method of operating the same. Uh, and he's got patent 1,251,388 method of and apparatus for controlling X-ray tubes. Hmm. A lot of C also's for him. But um, with the time remaining, I do want to see if I can read a couple of these offshoot things. Nernst Glower. Let's read this real quick. Yeah, it's a short one. The Nernst lamp was an early form of incandescent lamp. Nernst lamps, lamps did not use a glowing tungsten filament. Instead, they used a ceramic rod that was heated to incandescence. Because the rod, unlike tungsten wire, would not further oxidize when exposed to air, there was no need to enclose it within a vacuum or noble gas environment. The burners in Nernst lamps could, could operate exposed to the air and were only enclosed in glass to isolate the hot incandescent emitter from its environment. A ceramic of zirconium oxide, yttrium oxide, was, oh, a ceramic of that, that being, it, no wait, sorry, I don't know my, uh, my chemistry. A ceramic of zirconium oxide, yttrium oxide, was used as the glowing rod. Efficiency. Developed by the German physicist and chemist Walter Nernst in 1897 at University of Göttingen. Göttingen, Göttingen. These lamps were about twice as efficient as carbon filament lamps and emitted a more natural light, more similar in spectrum to daylight. The lamps were quite successfully marketed for a time, although they eventually lost out to the more efficient tungsten filament incandescent light bulb. One disadvantage of the Nernst design was that the ceramic rod was not electrically conductive at room temperature. <laughs> Bummer. So the lamps needed a separate heater filament to heat the ceramics efficiently to begin conducting electricity. Interesting. Manufacturing. In the U.S., Nernst sold the patent to George Westinghouse, who founded the Nernst Lamp Company at, Pitts, uh, at Pittsburgh in 1901. Minerals for the production of the glowers were extracted from the company's own mines at the legendary Behringer Hill, Texas, since 1937 submerged beneath the waters of Lake Buchanan. By 1904, a total of, 100, of, of over 130,000 Nernst lamps had been placed in service throughout the country. In Europe, the lamps were produced by the German 
äh, allgemeine Elektrizitätsgesellschaft AEG, <laughs> the AEG General Electric Company at Berlin. At the 1900 World Fair, World's Fair held in Paris, the pavilion of the AEG was illuminated by 800 Nernst lamps, which was said to be quite spectacular at the time. Scientific use. In addition to their usage for ordinary electric illumination, Nernst lamps were used in one of the first practical long-distance photoelectric facsimile, uh, oh, sorry, photoelectric facsimile, which is a fax system. Uh, designed by Professor Arthur Korn in 1902 and in Oliver Gulstrad's original slit lamp, 1911, which is used for ophthalmology to allow physicians to view inside of a patient's eye and contributed to Gulstrad's Nobel Prize Award. Was that all one sentence? Screw you guys for making that all one sentence. You can break that up. Whatever. Uh, even after Nernst lamps became obsolete as visible lamps, Nernst glowers continued to be used as the infrared emitting source used in IR spectroscopy devices. Their emission of infrared makes them inefficient as visible light sources, but perfect for IR spectro spectroscopy applications. Silicon carbide glow bars now compete for this purpose as they are conductive e even at room temperature and therefore need no preheating. Glow bar. Is, a, is used as a thermal light source for infrared spectroscopy. The preferred material for making glow bar is silicon carbide, uh, shaped as rather, uh, emits radiation from two to 50 micrometer wavelengths. Okay, let's look at these pictures. There's the Nernst 0.5 amps. So this has to be heated before it can uh, actually make anything. Parts of the Nernst lamp, glower, heater tube, mm -hmm. contact prong, interesting. Mm -mm -mm. And I realized I did not actually look at the pictures of Lang Muir. There's the handsome fella. There he is again in 1900 at like 20 something years old. He looks like. No, he doesn't look like the average chemistry student. Looks a bit better than the average chemistry student. Langmuir here in 22, so this is at about 40-something years old, um, in his lab at General Electricity, showing Radio Pioneer, oh, Marconi, Marconi, I know about him. Uh, a new 20, or at least I've heard about him. I shouldn't say I know him. Showing a new 20 kilowatt triode tube. And there's a pilotron. It's like a vacuum incandescent. Here's his house in Synecdoche. I don't see why it's a landmark, but whatever. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to uh, probably make a couple of separate videos of um, some other offshoot articles from here. Yeah, bye.